Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Vote Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard. As you note, this is still American Black History Month. And uh, as we're actually cum cumulating, if you will, uh, the highlighting, if you will, of our uh, uh, American Black History Month, uh, there's always a champion, as you note, that I tend to identify for the month of February. And uh, this particular person is someone that uh, uh, many of you know. You know his career. You know his involvement. You know his community involvement. You know him real, real well. And to, to, to not, the nominee and the selectee from the Oregon Voters Digest here at Portland Community Media is Baruti Archery. Welcome aboard, buddy. Good. Thank you, Bruce. Good, I'm glad good, to good. be here. All right. I really appreciate the fact that you're here with us and, and really right in front with you, you identify with many of the issues and, um, and, and accolades, uh, as, as, we, as we've always talked about uh, uh, history, uh, basically uh, our community, contribution to our community, especially our young people, yes. so they can look at themselves in terms of a career path and what, and this is the worth, if you will, of going to school. Because yep. as you know, yep. we're having some really tough times as far as trying to get our young people to go to school and then stay in Oregon. Yes. Yep. And so you were one of those persons right, right up front with you, as far as I'm concerned, that exemplified this whole piece. Thank you. And so we really want to welcome you aboard. And before we get in your interview, I got to ask you about your brother. I understand this is his birthday today. Today is my brother Yo. Joe's birthday, and I just want to give him a big shout out. He turned 60. During so 60 today. He, he got the big 60. The big 60. All right, Joe, yeah. you, you, you'll be on next year. How about that, Joe? Okay, fine. Okay, look. Well, what, what, what I'd like to do is that I'd like to spend a little time with, um, uh, with, with Baruti in terms of his background, his history, but just give you a feel, especially these young people out here, what you have to do, if you will, in order to achieve. And you can go anywhere. The stars are there. You can do what you want to do, but you're going to have to work hard. And Baruti is one of those persons that's done that. But just to give you a little background in terms of, of uh, some of his background, if you will, is, is that uh, he went to school. He's a graduate of Linfield College, right? Mm -hmm. Am I right for that? Yeah. With a dual major BA in business and education. University of California, Berkeley, Graduate School of Business, Executive Program, Harvard University, John F. Kennedy School of Government, Executive Programs. Uh, some of the awards and recognitions that I think you, you've had, Maruti, with City of Portland, Mayor's Spirit of Portland Award, right? Yes. Multnomah County's Public Health Hero Award, Willamette University's Living Legend Award, Enfield College, Men of, Men of Decades. I mean, it just goes on and on. And uh, Volunteer of America, 100 Stars Award, the African American Alliance for Home Ownership Award of Excellence, Portland Trailblazers, Black History Month honoree, African American Health Coalition, 2011, Walt Grand Marshal. And then some of the some of the community stuff and some of the mm -hmm. folks that you, some of the boards that you actually identified with. I'm sure there are many more, mm -hmm. but just some of the ones that I, I've identified was board chair of the Urban League of Portland, for instance, co-chair of the African American Alliance, board chair partners in diversity, member of Portland Trailblazers Community Advisory Board, vice chair of the Northeast Community Development Corporation, board member of Portland Business Line, and many, many, many more. You know, and and then when you start thinking about uh, some of the areas that. Uh, uh, you were consulting in, uh, you had a consulting firm, and, yes, but correct. the bottom line that uh, some of the areas that you've consulted, City of Portland Housing Bureau, National Association of Minority Contractors, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that, that I, I brought the issue over, but you, you took the baton, mm -hmm. and you appreciate that very much, and as you know, Posey and all those other guys are involved mm -hmm. in it, they're very important to contractors here in the state. Office of the Chair, Multnomah County Board of Commissioners, Metropolitan Family Services, Coast Industries, Inc., you know, I can still remember those yeah. those days. That's that's a very I know that's a good piece of yours. Spokane Community College Partners in Diversity, and you know, and and then I also think about uh, some of the areas that you actually worked at. You know, mm -hmm. here within within your your so-called public service, if yes. you will, along yes. that particular line. Regional Director for Diversity with Providence mm -hmm. Health and Services. That's a private entity, mm -hmm. and I think you spent quite a bit of time there. And Oregon's largest healthcare system. Everybody's been there. Mm -hmm. Some sure. seventeen thousand employees yeah. there that you were very much in part responsible, including development, implementation, and management of Oregon region's diversity program for contracting, education, caregiving, and community partnering. Deputy Director of the Portland Development Commission (PDC) in 1997. The agency is responsible for the city of Portland economic development, affordable housing, and urban renewal. Then we all know that. In fact, it, what comes out, uh, Trader Joe's comes out real mm -hmm. quick, like right now. But you know, the bottom line, wish you had been still there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we could still talk. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Director of Housing and, yeah. and Community Service for the state of Oregon, and that's where I met you in regards to put, build, building my senior mm -hmm. citizen complex. Because I had to work with you on that piece. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, by the way. Sure. And we still have that project. 
uh, president and currently co-owner of Coast Industries, where you did that, Oregon's oldest and largest minority-owned firm with a national customer base in commercial and government facility. I mean, Boise Cascade Corporation, 74 to 89, in various positions in sales and marketing, including national product manager. My point is that I've got two other pages here that I can go yeah, on and on pages, and on. Sir, on. Pages, but by now, i got some things yes. we got to talk about. Right, and I'm and, ready. And, yeah. I, and I want to share this with you. And, and Baruti, in all due respect, uh, I I'd, uh, naturally wanted to select you as as, as, as the nominee and, and, the, and the appointee of the uh, our, our example, if you will, uh, for the American Black History Month uh, here for the mm -hmm. Oregon Voters Digest. It's a very, very important piece. So the, the thing is, is that uh, I, I want to, I want to, I want to make sure that people out there in the community know your contributions. It's very important. You've done this here in the state of Oregon, city of Portland, often you, i.e., black community. It's just a community where yes. no residents happen to be black, but you were always identified from a diversity kind mm -hmm. of a guy. Cross the board. Yes. Sir. Very, very, very much involved. Okay. And um, and so I, I wanted to, us to talk about that, but at the same time, uh, I, I want to give you a, a moment or two to kind of dot the I's and the T's if there's some things there sure, that I might have sure. missed, if I, you I will. Would, I would love to. Okay. Well, Bruce, f first of all, let me just say I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Portland Community Media for this opportunity to come and really talk candidly and directly some about my history and some about what I see going on in our community right. that I have grave concerns about. Uh, and as you pointed out, uh, I've been around this community now for over 40 years. And one piece of my history that I think is really important, especially for the young people, is you have to also know, in spite of having served on the cabinets of two governors, in spite of having been a corporate exec, in spite of having been a business owner, uh, in spite of being a diversity director for Providence Health and Services and all the other awards and accolades, the thing that's really important, you need to know that I grew up in Compton, California, Neither of my parents graduated from high school. I was the first to get the opportunity to go to college. So whatever accomplishments I have had, it hasn't been just because of me. It's been because of a lot of other people's whose shoulders that I stand on. Mm -hmm. And in 1968, when Dr. Martin Luther King, this is a piece of history, when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated, Los Angeles put together a program called Los Angeles Programs for Education designed to assist black and brown kids get into college. I happened to have been one who was selected. This was a blessing. Wow. I was selected to, into a program as a junior in high school that led me to the state of Oregon, led me to college, and that was truly a turning point for my career. So because of Dr. King, I had a chance to go to college, and because of Dr. King and my upbringing, I've been very fortunate to give a lot back mm -hmm. to the community. Let me also, Bruce, in addition to thanking you, I just want to give a shout out to all the family and friends around the country that I know will be seeing this tape. And I say that because over the last nine months, there are a lot of family and friends from around the country that have been observing my career, my time in the mayor's office, and some of the challenges that I've had in the mayor's office. So there are a lot of people, uh, and you guys know who you are. I appreciate your support. I appreciate the uh, inspiration that you have given me as I've gone through my crisis, because many of you know that last year, when I went through my crisis, I've never made a public statement. I've never said anything about the incident that happened. And I also have to say, when I go back to L.A., my uh, friends I went to school with at Compton High School. We were the Compton Tar Babes. And so shout out to all the Tar Babes because I know you guys have been the most supportive. And the one thing that they said, I think it really couches this incident that we're talking about. And the incident occurred at Quartet Restaurant in June of last year. And in June of last year, when I introduced uh, Loretta Smith, I said, here is our beautiful county commissioner. Mm -hmm. My, 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 doesn't mm -hmm. she look good tonight? Yeah. And then I moved on to introduce someone else. Mm -hmm. That was it. And that got turned into an incident of sexual harassment. It turned into an incident where people were writing letters causing for me to be fired and terminate from the mayor's office. And I, for one, was very puzzled and baffled as to why this was happening. And I started asking questions myself trying mm -hmm. to understand exactly where this was coming from. Mm -hmm. My initial reaction was to, to apologize, which is what I did. Because I understand intent and impact. Any of us can intend one thing and have a negative impact on someone. So I apologize to her as I would to anyone else. If I made a statement without any intent of harm and they said they were offended, I would apologize. And that's what I did. 
To this day, I have never heard back from her. I gave her a verbal apology. I gave her a written apology. That, to me, I thought in and of itself was odd because this is someone that I had known for 30 years. This is someone that had my cell number. I have her cell number. This, If she was truly concerned with being called the word beautiful, she could have in five seconds called me, pulled me aside, and said, Baruti, when you introduce me, please don't call me beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that could have been resolved. Mm -hmm. And as a lot of my friends said, uh, those in California, when they heard about the incident, the first thing they said is, Baruti, you've been in Oregon too long. I said, why is that? They said, you know you can't call the white woman beautiful up in <laughs> Portland, Oregon. And I said, no, no, no. I said, this was not a white woman. This was a sister. Mm -hmm. And they said, what? You mean a sister was calling you on the carpet for calling her beautiful? I said, yeah, this was a sister. They said, Baruti, don't even say that anymore. This was not a sister. This might have been a black woman, but it wasn't a sister because the sister would not have done that. And I want to give an additional shout out to all the people who attended that reception that night. There were approximately 40 people in attendance, and I'd say at least 30 of them have reached out to me, and most of them right after the alleged incident, and said, Baruti, nothing happened. Baruti, you did nothing wrong. Baruti, we're so sorry that you got caught up in this, and what is going on? I even had one black pastor who was there in the audience standing six feet away from me who said, Baruti, you did not do or say anything you could not have said from any pulpit at a church in Portland. How often have you heard a pastor stand up in a pulpit and say, here is our beautiful first lady. My, my, my. Doesn't she look good tonight? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, that's it. Mm -hmm, it nothing mm -hmm. happens. Nobody feels anything. So I want to say I appreciate all those folks who were in attendance in spite of all the media bashing, in spite of all the people who have taken a very uh, innocent, meant to be complimentary statement and turn it into something ugly. Thank you for standing your ground. Thank you for speaking up to those people who weren't there but have tried to twist this for their own personal reasons. I appreciate you. I know who you are, and some of you I have seen. I also want to acknowledge all my former colleagues, all these positions that Bruce read off at State Housing, Boise Cascade, uh, working for Coast Industries, working for the Portland Development Commission, uh, Providence Health and Services. When this incident happened, I heard from women in every place that I have worked, going all the way back to the 70s, and said, Baruti, we are shocked. We are stunned. You were one of the first persons to give women the opportunity to move into outside sales. You were the first to give women the opportunity to move into management positions. And where is this coming from? And my track record and my career in terms of promoting diversity for all people and women, too, it's, it's almost unmatched in this state. It's almost unmatched in every position that I've had and the work that I've done. And so... Yes, it does upset me, and I get very worked up. When I was in the mayor's office, I agreed to be muzzled and to not say anything about this incident and let the investigation run its course. And the investigation ran its course, and I was found to be in violation of the city's sexual harassment policy. And what folks don't know, let me tell you the things that you don't know, and let me tell you the questions that the media never asked. Number one. The city of Portland harassment policy is not in line with the state or the federal harassment policy. I did not do anything in spite of any misconceptions that was in violation of any state laws or any federal laws. The city of Portland's policy is written tighter than any of those, and it's supposed to be based on objectivity. And what that means is that if you do or say something, all it takes is one person to say that they were offended and they were bothered, and you are found guilty of that. So when I went through an investigation process, and I showed up for an interview with a list of 12 people who were actually in the room when I made my statement, I was told that they would not even be interviewed because they've already interviewed whoever they wanted to interview on the incident. So none of those 12 people ever had a chance to be interviewed. No formal complaint. Uh, no, from no them. form. They were not able to make any statement in the investigation. And the people who were interviewed, I was told they couldn't even tell me who they talked to. So I don't even know who they talked to. And the 12 people who volunteered to put their names out there were baffled and say, how come we can't speak up and we can't say what we saw and mm -hmm. what we believe happened? And so, was, so I think the entire situation was one that was a mystery to me. 
Where is this coming from? Why is this happening this way? And the thing that I found is that the media, the local white media, so-called liberal white media, will take a story, even if it's incorrect, and run with it. And once they buy in to a certain storyline, regardless of what the facts are, they'll continue to promote that same storyline. Case in point, this is all I know, is that when I got called by the reporter asking about this incident, I gave him an honest answer. This is what I said. Mm -hmm. He has continued to misquote me. He has not quoted me appropriately. And every time he writes about it, he makes it a little bit more salacious because the more salacious it is, the more readers they have, the more hits they get to the website. So he wasn't interested in the facts. He just wanted whatever the salaciousness he could mm -hmm. draw mm -hmm. out of this. Mm -hmm. So what started out as maybe an, an insensitive comment or an inappropriate comment became a sexually suggestive comment, became a sexually suggestive humiliating comment. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the storyline that gets told. And, and, and the part that I really, really am concerned about, Bruce, I have to tell you, is that it makes me feel that as African Americans here in Portland, Oregon, we are not getting a fair shake when it comes to the media exposure. And I don't know why that should be shocking to anybody, because if you look at the media in the way that we as African Americans traditionally have been reported upon and exposed, we, it's always the most negative light. So in spite of the 40-year history that we just articulated mm -hmm. and how I've worked mm -hmm. in this community, have I've given, I've been out there to advocate for people in contracting when I didn't need a contract, mm -hmm. advocate people for housing when I didn't have to have a house, advocated for people with Portland Public Schools when I didn't have any kids in Portland Public Schools, advocate for health care for people in our community when I had health care. And I stepped up because of one, what Dr. King did for me to help me get a college education and because my belief in that to who much is given, much is expected. So I've given back. But then to have a reporter take a sound bite and try to define me by a sound bite, it's a sound bite. And the sound bite is whenever you read the sensitive, the sexually suggestive comment, the humiliating comment, the comment was, I called somebody beautiful. Mm -hmm. I call somebody beautiful. Mm -hmm. When you read that, just say beautiful. What did he do? He called somebody beautiful. So what I find is that with the media, I don't feel like they do the same due diligence mm -hmm. on the stuff in our community. Because nowhere in this media reporting do you see any of my history in terms of what I've done, what my contribution it is. Mm -hmm. It's how can we tarnish this black man's career. And there's some people who have done this and made a, a career out of it. And there's a repeat pattern. And there's some things that I see from the positions I've been in, in the private sector, the public sector, that are patterns of behavior that need to be called out. And that's where I'm at right now, because here's the, here's the bottom line. When you have a media that didn't ask the question, well, if Loretta said Baruti called her beautiful and she felt harassed, did anybody ask her, well, how come you just didn't pick up the phone and call him? Hmm. How come you didn't resolve it with a, a telephone conversation? If you were uncomfortable in personally addressing that, how come you didn't ask your African-American male chief of staff, Jimmy Brown, who's known Baruti for all these years, to call him to express concern? How come you didn't ask your public information officer, David Austin, another African-American male, to say anything? The media didn't ask her when she said there were two other incidents that I called her beautiful and she felt offended. They didn't go back and ask the people who sponsored those uh, particular events. One was a dinner with 100 people, the other was a dinner with 200 people. When they heard that those dinners were being pointed to as incidents where she felt harassed, the organizers told me that they did not see it that way, they did not agree. And if you have a situation, if anybody says something embarrassing to a woman with 100 people, somebody's going to say something. Yeah, right, right, and the right, event right. with 200 people, I got a letter commending me for giving my time and my talent for a fundraiser and keeping the event moving and telling jokes and, and, and telling stories and showing a sense of humor and giving shout outs. That's what I do. And so for somebody to take this and twist it and to turn it into something else, my first reaction is something's wrong. And Bruce, I knew within 48 hours exactly what was going on, exactly what was going on. And what it is, and this is something that you all need to understand, it's all about political retribution. Yeah. That in the positions I've had, I've had to be accountable. 
I believe in justice. I believe in accountability. And there's other folks in this community that I've had to hold accountable for what they've been charged to do and to protect the, the public resources. And in the process of doing that, those folks have started hating on me and been hating on me for a long time because they didn't like my decisions in the best interest of the public, um, uh, the public sector, the public community. And so as a result, when the opportunity came, some of these folks took that opportunity to try to take me out. And that's why I use the term, this was a political drive-by, hmm. a political hmm. drive-by. Hmm. And I'm from Compton. I know what a drive-by <laughs> is. A drive-by <laughs> is when a bunch of cowards get together, normally under the cover of darkness, and they try to kill somebody and try to get rid of them and then run away and sneak away, and they don't know who did it. That's what a drive-by is. But I also know that if you commit a drive-by, and if you don't take your subject out, you better be prepared to deal with consequences and repercussions. And so where I'm at, as I gathered all this information about who was behind this mm -hmm. political drive-by, then I had to decide, do I keep this information and sit on it, or do I share this with the public? And as I started learning more, I found out that I wasn't the only victim, that I was just the latest in a series of people who have been victimized, who have been demonized because of certain individuals in this community, mm. of certain individuals. And I'm not talking about all the African-American leadership, but we have some folks who have been out here who are primarily taking care of themselves and doing it under the disguise of doing what's best for the community. And so the part, and I'm going to share some, some more details on that, mm -hmm. but this is the part that I really want to share with you, is that my frustration is that going back and forth uh, to my hometown, L.A., and living in Portland, every time I come back, I start feeling like more and more lately, like a brother from another planet. Mm -hmm. I feel like I am living in the planet of Portlandia. I understand when you look at this community, there are certain dynamics that we just have to be real about. It's no accident that white folks have Portland as the number one preferred city in the country. It's no accident when we've got almost 75% uh, of our population are white folks here. They're very comfortable in Portland, Oregon. They're there. And the dynamics that that create is that all these people bring their background, their history, their knowledge, their education into this community. And so many of them want to ban under the umbrella of being liberal and being progressive and what that means for the minority community is that we're going to be paternalistic towards you mm. because we know better than you what should mm. be done. And if that doesn't work, we'll be patronizing. And if that doesn't work, we'll just be dismissive. So you have a lot of white people out there who sometimes have good intentions, but they also have all this baggage that they bring in and they think they have it all figured out. So that's what I see. But the other thing that really scares me is that some of these well-meaning white people are gullible and guilt-ridden, and there are black folks in this community that have and are continuing to take advantage of that. And so as a result, these black folks are running around, and in the name of doing what's best for the community, they are bullying, they are intimidating, and they are extorting monies from folks, monies from folks, and as a result, uh, it's not in the best interest. So, so that's why I talk about the planet of Portlandia, and that's why I use the term uh, house Negroes and scared Negroes. Hmm. You know, and, and, I, and I have to say, I'm speaking for myself. I don't work for the mayor now, so I can say what I need to say. Because when they was in the mayor's office, they said, I can't call nobody beautiful, you know, because uh, uh, that wouldn't be appropriate. So I, but I can say beautiful now. And I couldn't say Negro, because I referred to myself as a field Negro one time, and folks in this community just went crazy. And that's the other thing we, unfortunately, we as black folks find ourselves doing in this community. We're constantly trying to explain ourselves to white folks because they don't understand our culture. They don't understand mm -hmm. the nuances of how we move, how we talk, uh, how we communicate. And so if anything does not fit their paradigm of what they think is right, then they want to say, well, something's wrong with you. Something's wrong with you. So my number one message to all the black kids out there is this, is that you have to define yourself. Don't let anybody else define mm -hmm. you. Don't let a newspaper reporter, a columnist who has never met you, never talked mm -hmm. to you, try to define you by a statement and try to communicate to the rest of the world who you are and what you're not. It's no different than what our ancestors went through. Mm -hmm. When they were defined as slave, they were made chattel, they were property, they 
they were taking away their names. They didn't have families. They couldn't have religion. They couldn't enjoy their culture, the music, the art. They took everything away because we're in control. And you will be what we tell you to be. Mm -hmm. And if you had a chance to see the movie Roots, that's why it was so strategic when the Kuta Kente played the role. And they say, no, you're Toby. And he was almost killed before he would let them call him Toby versus Kunta Kente because it was his last opportunity to cling to who he was, the essence of who he was. Mm -hmm. And then by being stripped down, then we start to tell you, we being the majority, tell you what you are. We take everything away and then we put it back on you. So that my message to young people, don't let nobody else define you. Mm -hmm. You define yourself. Because if I let other people define me, I never would have left Compton. Because nobody in my family had graduated from high school. Nobody gone to college. You have to decide yourself. So define for yourself, and especially, again, some of these white folks in the media who are only writing to get media hits, hits they're not checking the accuracy of the information. They're not doing the facts checking. And, and how, you know, and for me, somebody who grew up in Compton, I'm sitting here, and I read the paper, and they're comparing me to Mel Gibson and his anti-Semitic rant. They're comparing me to Michael Richards and his rant using the N-word. They're comparing me to Paula Dean and her misguided comments in the newspaper next year. And I'm sitting there and a lot of the people around the country shaking their heads saying, Baruti, what kind of city are you living in? What kind of community is this? Don't these people know your history? And when I say these reporters, they don't know us. And because they don't value, I believe, who we are, they don't feel that we have a range of emotion. They don't feel that we have intellectual depth, depth or a political substance. And as a result, they want to make us so narrow that when I read the paper, all they got to say about me is Baruti is upset at Loretta and is on a revenge tactic. And that, too, is part of the story that's it's about revenge. So that's the only emotion I have, as opposed to being someone who has worked in the political arena, worked in the civic arena, worked in the private sector, who's seen the inside and out of politics, who understands community development, housing and contracting, who has something to say. And if he has something to say in regards to any political race, the community needs to put their heads up, because Baruti going to tell the truth, and especially for the black folks here. And then before I, and then this is the last piece that I want again, is that when I did my investigation and I started to find out how did this story get embellished so much right. that I could call somebody beautiful and it turns into sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. How could this happen? How could this happen? And the one thing that I saw is this town is small. Portland, Oregon itself is small. The African-American community is even smaller. It's not too much that happened in this community that doesn't get discussed, doesn't get talked about. Because we're so small, we mm -hmm. interact on the professional right. level. Yeah. We interact on a social level. Yeah. We interact on political levels. Mm -hmm. You know, we interact in many, many circles. So there are many, many relationships. Yeah. And so if something's going down, yeah. it's not hard to get information. Right. So within 48 hours, I had names of, that had come to me of what was driving this effort. And this is all, and this is the last thing I want to say, because in regards to Loretta, this is not about Loretta Smith. And the media has been trying to push that. So I'm saying to black folks, to white folks, I have no issue with Loretta, no issue with Loretta, because people are trying to make this into something else that is not, again, and, and they're trying to keep the eye off the ball of what the real story is. Hmm. My issue is with the puppet masters behind Loretta, my issues is with the people that she are, are working with who are taking advantage of this community and the public resources. And that's who I want to talk about. And the first one I will tell you who I'm very concerned about, and you as a community need to have a heads up. If, and again, I make no apologies because when I'm talking, I'm talking a lot to the black folks and to the black kids. And so some of y'all may not even saw the movie Django. But if you saw the movie Django, <laughs> the character that Samuel Adams played in the movie was a house Negro named Stephen. Mm -hmm. Stephen was so invested in the master's house and everything that he had, he was willing to sell out his people. He was willing to do anything he could to connive and do whatever he could for master. Well, the house Negro in this community is David Austin working for Multnomah County, the public information officer. Mm -hmm. I have not found anybody else that is a more accurate comparison to Stephen, the house Negro in Django. David, uh, David uh, uh, Austin 
His history here is he worked for the Oregonian as a reporter, and his major thing he did was to write negative articles about the black community or people in the black community. Now he's a public information for uh, uh, Multnomah County, and last year, when I was in the mayor's office, as the mayor uh, went back and forth with the county on the budget, David Austin, you could tell by his reactions to some of the stories, got very, very frustrated. And I think he seized on this opportunity of what was said, my calling Loretta Smith beautiful, and trying to leverage that to attack the mayor and attack the mayor's office. And so I could see David Austin as a former reporter calling up some of these columnists hmm. and calling up some of these folks to plant a story and say, hey, Baruti called Loretta beautiful. He's harassing her. And they ran the story. I don't understand how come these reporters didn't ask questions. And the other part is, is that before the article ran, I had four people call me and said, I've talked to the reporters and we've all told them we're shocked, we're surprised, nothing happened. But that never got reported. So from where I'm sitting, I'm going, whoa, wait a minute, where is this coming from? And I truly believe, based on the information I have, and it's not just one source, several sources, that David Austin is on a mission to assassinate the character of black men in this city. Hmm. He's done it repeatedly, and I just happen to be one of the latest victims <laughs> and all of that. And it really, and then I drive down the street and I see his picture on a on a on a bus stop billboard. And I sit there and I say, what kind of game is he running on this city? He's on a bus stop billboard, and I just shop. And then white folks run around thinking he's credible, thinking he represents this community, and he's their pipeline for what's going on in the African-American community, and he's a detached Negro, he's never worked in the community, never done anything, doesn't have any credibility, but he's got the nerve to step up and try to assassinate somebody who has been working in this community and delivering in this community for his own selfish reasons, to make himself look good. And so that's the first house Negro I wanted to bring out to y'all. And then, I'll tell you the second house Negro. The second house Negro, and again, when I say house Negroes, I want you to know what I mean. We understand. Okay, you, you understand, understand, but some of your white viewers may not I, understand. I understand it, but you know, house Negroes are people who are invested, so you know. Yeah, okay, yeah. so here's somebody else who was invested. And the scared Negro is somebody who knows the truth, but they scared to speak up. And there's a bunch of scared Negroes running around here too. And I can tell you about them on the next show. But, uh, but the other house Negro, and when I did this investigation, one of the things I saw was the week after this incident happened, there was a comment made in the newspaper by Roy J. Harris. And Roy J. Harris made a statement, and people came to me assuming that he was there, that what does Roy J. have to do with this? And I, too, was very taken back. Roy J. could have called me before he talked to the newspaper. He could have asked me some questions. I never heard anything from him, but he goes to the Oregonian and wants to put me on blast. And I was taken back. And when I finally started trying to figure it out, the first thing was I had to tell people, Roy J wasn't even there. Hmm. And why does he have to, why does he has anything to say about this? You know, what is his interest in this? Hmm. Well, let me tell you Roy J's involvement from my standpoint. When I worked as the director of diversity for Providence Health and Services, Roy J was promoting the African American Chamber of Commerce, and we joined the Chamber of Commerce for a couple of years. But I had a responsibility to Providence to make sure that the dollars we spent were wise investments in the community and that they were creating community benefit. And in this case, with the African American Chamber, after a couple of years, I started asking questions. Who is the board? Who is your membership? What are the programs that you're running? And mind you now, in the position I was in, I had a chance to help a lot of nonprofits who came through the door wanting to apply. I could assist them with their applications. I could point them in the direction of who to partner with to try to accomplish the common good for the community. Mm -hmm. In Roy's case, there was no partnering. It was all about join the chamber. And that's all I can tell. And I could be wrong, but from what I can tell, they hold a monthly uh, reception. And I don't see where they're doing much for the community. That number one. Mm -hmm. And so, and so it was the African American Chamber of Commerce. There's questions about whether or not they're a nonprofit or a for profit. And for me, I made a decision and I told Roy I could not support an organization that was not uh, benefiting the community. Mm -hmm. And so, part of the thing and throughout my uh, career, Bruce, I have been uh, one who speaks truth to power. 
And I found that black folks love it when I go downtown and I'm talking uh, to city council, or the, or the Portland Development Commission, or I go in to talk to some of the major corporations about contracting on their behalf. Uh, and they love it, you know, when I've done a lot of these things. But some of those same black people, when I turn around and say I want to hold them accountable mm -hmm. and I ask them to slow their role, ask them to step up and do what they're supposed to be doing exactly as I've done as a public servant, mm -hmm. then they get mad and upset. Instead of stepping up to the plate, they want to get upset and make you the issue because you called them on the carpet. Mm -hmm. So in Roy J's case, yeah, I called him on the carpet and told him I would never support anything that wasn't working for the benefit of the community. So little did I know, but that made me a target. Mm -hmm. So as a result, any and everything I've done, because I'm not going along to get along, mm -hmm. then I'm a target. I'm a target with him. You know, and so and I recognize that. And so I find out that, yeah, he's mixed up into this. And then I find out that it's not just me, that there are other people who have been victimized by the same people, the same organizations. And this and, and then secondly, as I started being more vocal about being a victim of a political drive-by, people start coming to me, people in the community, primarily African Americans who have been done wrong, who feel they have been cheated, that they have been lied on, that they have been demonized. And it wasn't just three or four. I mean, 10 people coming to me saying, let me tell you what happened to me. Let me mm -hmm. tell you what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting hit with all this information. And then I finally, towards the end of last year, after I had retired from the mayor's office, and figured out that this really was a political drive-by that was based on retributions. And there's other folks involved, too, that I'll share their names later. But, uh, but it was all based on uh, political retributions. And the other thing I should make sure that you know, in spite of what the media said in the final investigation, there was no gyrations. You know, People made a big deal out of that. The media took the story and ran with it. One reporter reported something. All the other newspapers picked up on it. Then the TV newspaper picked up on it, saying, well, as reported here. So this whole thing that Baruti said this and he was gyrating, that is not true. And the final investigation said, no, that did not happen. One person said that, and it was never substantiated by anybody else, including Loretta. There was no gyrations. There was no, for the black folks, there was no bump and grind. I'm sorry mm. to tell you. There was no mm. bump and grind involved in this. Mm. That was one of the things. And the other thing, they, and, and then again, as reported, that I said, mm, mm, mm -hmm. I don't even talk like that. Saying, you know, that, as the pastor said, you know, you. it's uncommon in the pulpit that you will hear a pastor or someone say, my, 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 uh, 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 uh. You know, and that's something. It could read the Bible, read scripture from the Bible and mm -hmm. go, uh, uh, uh. Mm -hmm. My, my, my. But our white media, they do not understand, understand. the cultural mm -hmm. nuances and they think they're so damn smart. They ain't got to go ask nobody. Mm -hmm. And if they do go ask somebody, they ask in some house Negro who doesn't even have a pipeline into the community, doesn't even know what's going on. So he's going to give and tell them what they want to hear to support what they want to do. So those are two people that I definitely want to put out there. And, and, uh, and then the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll share with you, Bruce, because I take this very serious. I know you do. That's this is very to serious you. to me. And that uh, someone who spent a lot of time uh, working in the public sector. And when I was with Oregon Housing Economic Development Department, I ran an agency that was $350 million a year. When I worked at Boise Cascade in my 30s, I ran a western region of 13 states that was over $150 million a year in sales. And Portland Development Commission, again, we were at the time to over $200 million in uh, resources we were responsible for. And I've always taken great pride in every position that I've been in to be a good steward, to be very transparent, and to be accountable. And that's what I've done. And I, in turn, have turned around. And those people who have done business with me, I've held them to the same standard. So when you get to the point where you've got a group of people who are uncomfortable with that standard, and they turn around and want to attack the very person who has been doing their job in the public interest, then it's time to call them out. And it's time to say something about who they are. And so, and that's why I'm here, because for me, the one thing that pushes my button is this issue of black on black crime. And having worked in public safety, we have black on black crime in our community, and often we'll have a drive-by shooting in the community, we'll have a bunch of witnesses and people see it, but nobody will talk, nobody says anything. So the perpetrators of drive-by shootings, they continue to do it because they know they can get away with it. Well, what we have happening at a higher level in this community is black on black crime by a few 
so-called black executives who are self-appointed leaders, who are self-serving, and they're doing political drive-bys on people in this community for their own self-serving purposes, and they need to be called out, and we need to speak up. So on my part, I practice exactly what I have uh, encouraging people at the street level, that if you witness a crime, instead of taking it in your own hands and retaliating, give it to the authorities. Let them do with it. Mm -hmm. And I'll say to my Aunt Bebe in Watts, California, I took your advice. I took your advice because this issue has affected four generations in my family. That here, locally, when my name was getting dragged through the mud in regards to sexually harassing people, it affected my son and his work environment. I have four grandsons in this community, and they're coming to me and saying, Papa, what did you do wrong? And when I say I called a woman beautiful, they say, you mean I can't call mama beautiful anymore? No, mm -hmm. Kareem, mm -hmm. Khalid, call your mama beautiful. Mm -hmm. And if I see a beautiful woman walking down the street, I'm going to call her beautiful too. Uh, and so, and because I did. After this happened, I saw a beautiful sister walking down the street from Africa, the Caribbean, and some flowing colors. And I'm walking down the street, and I see her walking towards me. And I'm going, oh, if I tell her she's beautiful, I'm going to get in trouble. And I tried not to, and I saw her, and I got right up on her, and I said, sister, sister. And she said, brother, brother. I said, you look beautiful. She said, thank you, thank you. And it made my day. And I say, I'm 60-some years old. You know, I can represent myself. And so I just want to say that it's upset me that this has affected all the way down to my grandchildren, my son, affected me, and my 85-year-old aunt in Watts, California. He's the last living person of my mother and father's generation. And she has to sit down with me when I visit her and talk about what's going on with this black girl up in Portland. Mm -hmm. And why, you called her beautiful. What is this about? And I'm trying to explain to her. And when I start sharing some of the details about the political drive-by and all of that, see, in our family, we have been victims of drive-by, and we have been perpetrators of drive-by in Compton. I'm talking about my cousins, my nephew. You know, I know what a drive-by is. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. my auntie, 85-year-old, says, we don't want to go there. So I have taken the information given to me, and I have turned it over to the proper authorities, and that's the U.S. Justice Department, because some of the stuff given to me was just outright unethical behavior, unprofessional behavior. But people came to me with some information that was outright illegal behavior. So the Justice Department has the information. They're doing an investigation uh, around both the African-American Chamber of Commerce and Project Clean Slate, because what's been committed has been, I believe, it's been a fraud in open, wide in the open. And it's a fraud. So I'll stop there, Bruce. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to give you a break, and we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with Baruti. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back again, folks. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard, your host, Oregon Voters Digest. Again, uh, our nominee and, 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 and a, a person that we're identifying with as far as African-American Black History Month is Baruti Atari. And I would like to say to the to viewing audience, you know, is that um, I went to Baruti initially 
because I wanted to interview him because we wanted to talk about that because I knew about his career, I knew about his past, and I thought it, was a, it would be of value, if you will, to the community, but more important to the young people in, this, in our community, and also give him thank and thanking him for all of the things that he had done in this particular community. And then up jumped this in interview, and all of a sudden he was kind of like, hey, Bruce, I'm not into this piece anymore. I just don't have, I just don't feel good about it. I said, no, hey, look, we talked and we talked and we talked, and I told him, I said, look, man, you owe it back to the community. Not only you owe it to the community, you owe it to yourself because you did nothing wrong. I've known Loretta, Loretta Smith for a number of years when she was working for, 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 for Senator Ron Wyden. I visited that office many, many times, and I know I've said many times she, she's beautiful, and she is a lovely young lady. And, um, and I, I, I just couldn't understand why that was an issue, and unfortunately, I couldn't have, uh, I thought Loretta would have given me a call back, if you will, to talk about this particular issue, but she didn't, and unfortunately, that's just the way it is. But I still would, I, I'm still open, if you will, to her to come and, and share her feelings about this piece, because like, like Baruti, I would have thought that someone would have said to her, if whoever she went to would have said, okay, fine, if it, if it offended you or whatever, they would have recommended that she contacted Baruti right up front. Or if not that, the entity who she contacted and made that point would have contacted him. And then he would have said, as he, as he said, he apologized. So that's where we are. But I wanted to make sure that he's given this opportunity, if you will, to relieve himself, to offset. This is stressful. It's very stressful. I mean, I'm sitting here, and all due respect, I've made many statements at times that I wouldn't be caught in this town if, it, if, I, if I didn't have this show. How many times have I been hit and backstabbed and whatever? But the bottom line is this. The fact of the matter is it's raining here. He's here today. I want to thank him very much for, for coming here and sharing with the, especially the young people and the community as a whole of what he's contributed to this community. And it's very, very important. So, so again, thank you for doing this, buddy. Appreciate it. And, and now Appreciate the other that. thing I want to do, that's a couple of questions. I, okay. I gave you the opportunity. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. First off, on this particular incident, we know about your past. And, I mean, I can deal with that more than But the thing I'm interested in is that when were you first, when, when did you get the first when you were, when you were when, when did you first learn that that was a complaint, and when you were first learning the complaint, and then what did you do after that? Did you contact? You said you oh, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, to me sure, that's a fair question. Uh, my first uh, inkling there was a problem. This uh, reception happened on a Thursday night. Uh, again, there were about forty people in attendance, and I left there like every, most people, I think, feeling like it was a wonderful event. We had accomplished the objective that we had intended was to talk about the uh, Office of Equity and explain to the community what they had done, and the feedback we got was all very good. Friday afternoon, I was contacted by the Chief of Staff, Gail Shibley, and said that uh, there had been a complaint from Loretta Smith that she was very disturbed that I had referred to her as a beautiful. Was this a formal complaint in writing, or what? Uh, How did she, did uh, she give well, you something? I think it came in the form of a phone call, possibly from her Chief of Staff to the Mayor's office, mm -hmm. if I can recall. I think that's how it Came in. Kind of and everybody was again we were all very taken back my first reaction was oh you must be kidding I said I know Loretta and I have I admit it I said I've, yeah, I've introduced yeah. her as beautiful on yeah. two other occasions mm -hmm. and each time she appeared to take it as a compliment yeah. and which is the way it was intended and uh, this time uh, the chief of staff said oh she's very upset and so immediately without knowing any more than that I said well I need to call and apologize okay. that was not my intent okay. so within 30 minutes of being told she was offended, I picked the phone up and called, and I left a message that was along the lines, uh, Loretta, I'm very sorry to hear that my mm -hmm. introduction was offensive. You know I've always been supportive of you. I supported mm -hmm. you when you ran for office, mm -hmm. and uh, I was very surprised, you know, about this. Give me a call. Let's talk. Uh, Monday morning, uh, uh, had not heard from Loretta, and I think she had indicated at that time uh, she wanted to talk to the mayor. And I'm still shocked because this is somebody I've known for 30 years. We've worked together. Thought that I would have considered someone who was a friend. We should have been able to talk and work this out. And a lot of the women said, you know, that unfortunately it felt like uh, she was playing the victim instead of being an empowered woman and stepping up. And other folks said, well, maybe she's just being elitist that she wants you to call her Miss Ann. I said, I don't know what mm -hmm. the issue is. Other people said, maybe your profile is too high. Maybe mm -hmm. she's upset mm -hmm. because you, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I can't read what her motivations mm -hmm. were, but I know that this came out of left field. The one thing that I do know though is this. The last time Loretta called me on my cell phone was in January of 2013, mm -hmm. a few days before I started working in the mayor's office. Mm -hmm. I spent the month of January 2013 transitioning from my consulting business to the mayor's office, had really worked hard, and decided the week before I started work to spend some time in California with my family. Mm -hmm. And while I was in California, my cell phone rings, and I see it's Loretta Smith, 
And normally, when I'm on vacation, especially at that point, I wouldn't have even answered the phone. But I answered it because it was her. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I answered the phone, she says, Baruti, do you know what your boss did? And I was like, what? And this story I'm telling you, I've repeated this many times right Mm -hmm. after this incident happened. Mm -hmm. And I said, what? What are you talking about? She said, your boss has cut the money for the summer jobs programs. And she was very upset. You know, and I understood the reason she was upset. But then she started saying, well, Baruti, you need to tell him this. You need to do this. And I was like, whoa, whoa. I said, I said, pardon me. I said, Loretta, I said, uh, let me explain that. Number one, I don't know what you're talking about. And number two, I haven't even started working in the mayor's office yet. I will be there next week. And number three, I'm currently in California trying to get a few days uh, R&R before I do start work. And then she proceeded to still press the issue. And my last comment to her was, well, if you feel this strongly, you're an elected official. Why don't you call the mayor direct and Mm -hmm. you should deal with it? Mm -hmm. And she almost gasped like, like, I don't know what I was supposed to do. Like, I didn't jump high enough. I didn't jump fast enough. And she never called me again on the cell phone. And then the next thing I know. We are into the budget process, and through the spring, as you get into the months of March, April, into May, the county and the city was going back and forth on the budget, and there was a whole lot of concerns about what was going on, and the city with a $21.5 million deficit was giving back to the county programs it had funded over the last 10 years uh, when the county didn't have money, but this time the county had surplus, so programs went back. Some folks at the county weren't very excited. But that wasn't your job. That wasn't my job. Yeah, it wasn't my job. It's the mayor. What was your job? What was your job? But that, that was the mayor's job. Right, My job as a policy advisor to the mayor was to be an advisor and a liaison primarily to the Portland Police Department right. and to work with them there. But also as a policy advisor, I gave him my input, my advice uh, uh, based on my experience as it related to issues involving the community and anything that came up uh, within the scope of where I felt I could add value. So with the budget, yeah. I contributed, I added value, but the final decision had nothing to do with me. And so I really do believe that uh, from whatever reasons, I just happened to be a victim who got caught in the middle of this drive-by, mm-hmm. that there was evidently some angst, I believe, coming from the county towards the city, and and whatever I said was an opportunity to try to embarrass the mayor or to call the mayor on the carpet or to get back at the mayor. So, uh, so again, I think David Austin is the one who spearheaded this. You know, I think he was the one who spearheaded this, and that's why. And and I think Loretta just happened to be a pawn in this, and I think Roy J jumped on the bandwagon to help push this issue. And Roy J, why was he involved in this? Because the event was at Quartet Restaurant. Yeah. Roy J has been trying to sue Quartet Restaurant. He's been mad at them. He's done everything <laughs> leading up to this event yeah. to make them look bad. And this was another opportunity for him to make a legitimate business look bad. Okay. And so I think that was part of the okay. drive-by, too. Let me throw this other piece out to you. Now, these are the medias. The Portland Observer, not Portland Observer, the Portland Tribune, uh, the, the Willamette Week, the Oregonian. I mean, everybody, you know, Steve Dean did it on his, in his column and whatever, mm-hmm. in the Oregonian, whatever. Once those things happened, were you ever contacted by the African-American community newspapers, the Portland Observer or the Scanner newspaper? My point is that to give, mm-hmm. to give you the opportunity to mm-hmm. share what you've just shared with us here. Yeah. Well, uh, well first let me Don't say that uh, uh, when this was all going on, right. I did have the, the major media reaching out, but I took a vow of silence and agreed okay. to be Muslim okay. uh, because this was politically uh, very sensitive and people were trying to work all the angles and everything else on this. So I didn't make any statements to them. But, but they, they, I told, they did make an yeah. attempt to contact you. Yeah, they did okay. reach out and I said okay. no comment. But what surprised me again, some of these columnists are people who I've read for years mm-hmm. and people I have had a lot of respect for mm-hmm. and people who I thought at the very minimum would do some fact checking to look at the accuracy of this, to look at the story behind the story, to peel that onion back. And just by asking a couple of questions, going back to the people who put on the advance where there was allegedly some embarrassment, asking those, even talking to the people in attendance. When you got 30 people there, you know, and saying nothing happened, and people coming to me and saying, what's going on? And the media, and the media, I believe, is totally disconnected with the African American community. Because as I moved with the African American community, and I want to say shout out to all the folks in the community, all the sisters who have come up and just hugged me and say, brother, you can call me beautiful anytime. (laughs) And there's a lot of sisters who say, you know, you can't get a brother to tell 
a sister, she's beautiful in this city. <laughs> and you get chastised. Well, thank you, Jeez. sisters, for that. All the brothers who came up and said, wait a minute, something is wrong. This does not make sense. Jeez. And all the white people who have come up to me and says, I don't even understand the African-American culture, mm -hmm. but something is fishy about mm -hmm. this. Thank you all for your comments and your support. And that's part of the reason I decided this needs to come out. Another question I'd like to ask you, did you get anything in a written format complaint signed by Loretta, Commissioner Loretta Smith? In no. any ways, did you get a formal written complaint? No. In your hand? No. Saying, I've objected to this, this is harassment. Did you get anything from the city accordingly? I, I, I have a copy of the final investigation from the okay, city. Okay, but you didn't get anything from her that says basically Loretta Smith? Yeah, no. No, no. But, but you know, the... Uh, the thing that I, you know, as I went through this, yeah. I've, I've had so many people who said, Baruti, how could you go through this media scrutiny? Because it became a media circus, as you know. I showed up at City Hall. Media was waiting for me like they 60 minutes or wow. something because I called a woman beautiful. Jeez. They went to the house to interview my ex-wife. Oh. Uh, you know, that they, you know, came to my house looking for me. And I just said I wasn't going to say anything. And, and part of it was, I said, because I was very bitter about this. I was very upset. I'm glad I didn't talk. Because when the investigation concluded, and the conclusion was because of the city of Portland uh, standard of objectivity, and all it takes is one person to convict you of being guilty, then we have that one person. She said this. Whether it's true or not. You wow. know, we wow. have to accept this, wow. and I'm guilty. So when that all came out, you know, it was never an opportunity to tell the whole story. Mm -hmm. Well, look, we got about 40 seconds left. Um, again, any lasting comment? Give me a yeah. good, one lasting comment real quick. This, this is the last comment that I real would quick. give with you. When people ask me, how did I go through this, at, that as a man and understanding the word, I know that the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and there are people in our community who operate in, co in cahoots with the devil. They're about stealing from people. They're about killing people's spirit, killing people's career. They're about destroying people. And we have agents that are in our community. And for me, more than anything else, the Bible says precious ointment is not as good as one's name. And I'm about restoring my name for myself, my son, my children. I'm not going to let folks damage my name because I call the sister beautiful and try to banish me from the public discourse in terms of what's happening in this community. Marie, thank you very much. And again, thank you very much, my brother. Glad to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. You, you are our champion for thank the you, American brother. African American businessman. Appreciate okay, it. Okay, fine. Folks, you've got it. And thank you again very much. And, uh, and as one would say, um, you can also share this program with a number of other folks. Uh, as you know, you, you can go on YouTube and the like and whatever. But again, it's very, very important that uh, we are a community. Watch those drive-bys, by the way. Again, have a good one. I'll see you next week. Take care.